know as, as Christians who live in these United States that we live in, we are so blessed. And we can still gather together and worship our Lord and Savior without fear of our guards coming in. And even though sometimes it seems nowadays that our views are not respected as they used to be, we're still able to worship. And uh, for that, we should be joyful. And I've always said that Christians in this country should be the most joyful people of the whole world because of where we live and also because of where we're going. This song I want to share with you this morning, it's a happy song. And uh, it says that if your name's written on the roll in heaven, then by golly, you're ready to rock.
All right, I hope you have your scripture there in front of you. If you turn with me to Luke's Gospel, chapter 6. Everybody wants to be happy. They search for it all the time. Our Declaration of Independence guarantees us the rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Fairy tales often end that way. They, live, they end with, and they lived happily ever after. <clears throat> Sometimes uh, those are just stories, though. Sometimes those are not real life. In fact, some would say most life is not a happy story. Those are just fairy tales. Well, I want to be able to share with you that God promises us that we can be happy. And he does those through the Beatitudes that are found here in Luke 6, also in Matthew 5. And as we look at them, we're going to ask the question, can we really be happy in this life? And if so, what is it that brings us the happiness that we are to have? In this passage, we're going to see that Luke has four things that says, if you do these, you will be blessed. And four things, he says, if you do these, you are under the, a woe or a watchfulness of God that is not desiring. As if to say, you are blessed by him if you are in his favor in doing these and you are not blessed by him and in fact he is against you if you do these thus he's showing us how to be either supremely happy or supremely sad and i don't know anybody who would choose to be supremely sad but jesus draws a line down the middle and he challenges us to come to his side Come over to my side, and I'll show you what it means to be happy. And as he shows us what it means to be happy, it is not what the happiness of the world is. And in fact, we're going to see it's just the opposite. It is like an upside-down cake. You would think that you're eating it right side up, but you're eating it upside down. And the Lord is giving us an indication that happiness has to do with him instead of the situations or the circumstances of life. William Barclay wrote this, the challenge of the Beatitudes is, will you be happy in the world's way or in Christ's way? Which way will you be happy? So let's stand as we reverence the reading of God's word. Chapter 6, beginning in verse 12. One of those days, Jesus went out to a mountainside to pray, and he spent the night praying to God. And when morning came, he called his disciples to him, and he chose 12 of them, whom he also designated apostles, Simon, who is, whom he named Peter, his brother Andrew, James, John, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James, son of Alphaeus, Simon, who is called the Zealot, and Judas, son of James, and Judas Iscariot, who became a traitor. He went down with them and stood on a level place, and a large crowd of his disciples was there, and a great number of people from all over Judea, from Jerusalem, and from the coast of Tyre and Sidon, who had come to hear him and to be healed of their diseases. Those troubled by evil spirits were, cu were cured, and the, pe and the people all tried to touch him because power was coming from him and healing, and he was healing them all. Looking at his disciples, he said, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who hunger now, for you will be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. And blessed are you when men hate you, 
And when they exclude you and insult you and reject your name as evil because of the Son of Man, rejoice in that day and leap for joy because great is your reward in heaven. For this is how their fathers treated the prophets. But woe to you who are rich. For you have already received your comfort. Woe to you who are well fed now. For you will go hungry. Woe to you who laugh now. For you will mourn and weep. And woe to you when men speak well of you. For that is how their fathers treated the false prophets. You may be seated. Jesus up on a mountain. We don't know if, uh, if the sermon that he preaches at the bottom of the hill or maybe on the hill at a plateau, at least a level place where he's at, is the same one he preached in Matthew 5 or not. If not, it has a lot of the same similarities of that passage. Jesus is up on the mountain. He had been there through the night praying. He, he has 12 disciples that he calls to himself and he names them by name. And he designates them as his inner circle, his apostles, as the scripture tells us. And then he comes down to where the people are bringing, as it is said, the apostles with him, and then he begins to share in a, in a very large way, a way that is speaking out to many people because it says that they came from geography of Jerusalem, all over Judea. They came from Tyre and Sidon, the cities by the sea. They were troubled and they wanted to be healed and they were because power was coming from him. And then looking at his disciples, we have to make a decision as to who the disciples are. Are they just the 12 or are they the other disciples there? Because it mentions that he came down and there were many disciples that were there. A large crowd, verse 17, a large crowd of his disciples was there and a great number of people. So I believe that he's speaking to everyone there, his disciples who are there at the bottom or on the side of the hill, at least on a level place. And he begins to tell them how to live happily ever after. The word happily comes from the beatitude word to be blessed. Blessed are you, Matthew says, blessed are you, blessed are you. And that word blessing really means happy. Happy are you. Happy are you, happy are you if you do this. And then he tells them why. First point of our outline is going to lead us into four additional points. Our only point is going to lead us into four. And here it is, to live happily ever after, you must see that there are two and only two ways to live. And you must commit yourself to one. There are two and only two ways to live, and you have the choice which way you're going to live. Jesus draws a clear line for two different groups of people who must identify with one. There is no straddling of the line. There are one side that is poor, who are hungry, and who weep now and are despised by men because of their identification with Jesus. These are the ones who are blessed. I can imagine the question, are you saying that I am going to be happy if I'm poor and hungry and I'm weeping and men hate me? Is that how I am going to be happy? Because that doesn't sound like a very good success story on how to be happy. But in understanding what those mean is the key to what this whole passage says. So on one side, we have rich people who are now well-fed and laugh a lot. And they're acclaimed by men. And they're under the woe or the hand of God that is against them. And the others who are 
under the hand of God who is for them. Immediately we are faced with a problem of what does this passage mean? What do these Beatitudes mean? The first is, blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. You see, when we look at these, we have to decide, is he speaking about the physical or is he speaking about the spiritual? And we know from looking at scripture that he doesn't always say, hey, if you're poor, then you're on my side. That's not what he's talking about. In fact, there are many people who followed Jesus. In fact, St. Augustine said that the beggar who went into heaven was poor. Remember, he begged for food and he died and he went to heaven and he laid his head upon Abraham's bosom. And Abraham was rich, the scripture tells us. Elsewhere in Luke, it tells us that the ladies who provided for Jesus and his disciples care for a while were ladies of wealth. So they had wealth there. So he's not saying that, hey, just because you have some money or just because you are poor doesn't mean it in a physical way. Matthew is telling us that in this Blessed are the poor, and it says, blessed are the poor in spirit. Jesus is also not commending or condemning those who are hungry because they don't eat a healthy diet. He's also not, not promoting a weeping or a sadness instead of being happy and joyful and having laughter. And how can there be any real spiritual virtue for someone to hate you. We have to understand what God's word says. And so Jesus is issuing a, not issuing a blanket of approval for those who are poor in a, in a physical way, but he is saying you who are poor in the ways of me. In other words, those who see yourself as needing me. You are poor in yourself. In fact, you can't achieve, you can't receive anything of mine without your acknowledging first your great need. See, a reason why most people today do not come and seek Lord is they're fine on themselves. Thank you. I really don't need the things of God. I really don't need those things. I'm doing well, very well, thank you. But the Bible commands that we are to be needing of him, that we are to be people who need him. And the Bible commands that we are to be filled with joy and to be filled with praise. And the Bible commends us that we are to be well thought of from a biblical point of view, the people should look at us from that point of view. It's easy for us to get a, a people to like us. All you have to do is give them things. You give them things, they will like you. But the Lord said this is not about giving them things. This is about being a person who receives accolades from somebody for the right reasons. And oftentimes the world will not give you that. Blessed are you who are poor. A life that is a spiritual need for God. But also, it could also be a material need. Rather than pursuing a life of accumulating the world's wealth, people have now recognized their spiritual need before God and have come before him, often at the expense of worldly success. Jesus' words, Woe to you who are rich, for you are receiving your comfort in full. He is referring to those who are living as if this world was all they have. They're not rich towards God. They're not laying up themselves treasures in heaven. They're living a selfish life, receiving the pleasures and the comforts for themselves and relying on themselves to gain all these things. John Wendell and his sisters 
were some of the most miserly people of all time. Although they had received a large inheritance when their father died, they spent very little of it and did all they could to keep the wealth for themselves. John was able to convince his five sisters not to marry. And they lived in the same house in New York City for 50 years. And when the last sister died in 1931, the value of her estate was over $100 million. Her only dress was the one that she made for herself and she had worn it for 25 years. The Wendells had such an urge to hold on to their possessions that they lived like paupers. And even worse, they were like the kind of people that Jesus referred to that says, that they lay up treasures for themselves and they are not rich towards God. A Gallup poll some years ago, probably still true to today, says almost half of all charitable giving are given by households that make $30,000 or less. Isn't that amazing? Not given by the wealthy, it's given by households that make $30,000 or less. You know, I used to feel bad about asking you to give. I don't feel that way anymore. In fact, get your billfolds out. No, I'm kidding. <clears throat> I used to feel bad about that because I thought I'm asking them to give from their money to some other, other thing that's going to separate them from their money. But you know what God has revealed to me is that I am giving you opportunities to be able to store up for yourselves not treasure here on earth, but treasures in heaven. So I bring things to you, and I've told you, I will not bring anything to you to give to that I don't first give to myself. And when I give, I am hoping that you too will follow the example and give as well, because when you give with the right heart, you are storing up for yourselves treasures in heaven that will not rot and they will, moths will not tear into and ruin. And you realize that everything that you and I have here upon the earth is going to be left when we leave. My kids may get some, you may get some. If we have any left over, praise God. I'm hoping that when we get to the end, our money runs out as well. Sorry about that, Matt and Hannah. <laughs> <coughs> So we don't give just to give. We give with the idea that one day, one day the Lord is recalling things that probably Linda and I have forgot about giving to a long time ago. And we've also realized that this thing about being poor towards the Lord is poor in spirit to where I say, I'm depending upon God for everything. I'm depending upon you. And if you will provide it for me and you will give it for, to me, then I will share it as you want me to share it. It's good to be a hilarious giver, the scripture says, to give with joy in your heart, knowing that God is given to you over and over again. So here we are in this thing, talking about being people who are poor, poor towards the things of the world sometimes in a physical way, but certainly in a spiritual way. I'm not putting my trust in myself. I'm certainly not trusting in the wealth of this world. I'm putting my trust in the things of God. And then he says, blessed are those who hunger now, for they will be satisfied. Can I just go back up to the poor just one second? Blessed are you who are poor, you who are poor, listen, you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Did you know you have a part in the kingdom of God? It is not in the future. These others are in the future. This is something that's going to be given in the future. But this one is the present. Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. You're an owner in the kingdom. 
the kingdom is owned by the king and his children. And he is a bountiful and blessed one who has given it to us. Blessed are you who hunger now, for you will be satisfied. You will be satisfied if you hunger now. Is it meaning that we are to go around and not have any food? Does it mean we give away all our money and therefore we have nothing to eat? No. What are you hungry for? Are you hungry for the things of God? Or are you hungry for the things of the world? He's raking a line down the middle. And these are black and white. There is no in between. To where it says at the bottom, but woe to you who are fed well now, for you will go hungry. Does that mean I have some trouble coming ahead? Because it looks like I'm pretty well fed right now, doesn't it? No. It says, are you hungry for the things of God? Or are you well fed by the things of the world? Are you well fed in the things that you have? Are you, are you dining and eating well in the things that God has for you? Or are you hungering after the things? that only God can provide. Because he pronounces the woe there, they will go hungry. Those who are physically hungry are truly blessed if they come to God in their own need and learn to rely on him to meet all their needs as that caring father always does. Those who are physically well fed are truly to be pitied if they ignore the spiritual starvation and their need for God, a God who sustains them both physically and spiritually. The third one is, blessed are those who weep now for they will laugh, but woe to those Woe to those who laugh now, for you will mourn and weep. Jesus blesses those who weep now. He's referring to followers who suffer in in this wicked world because of their identification with him. Look at the scripture with me. He is speaking to his disciples, and it seems as though he is telling them that they are in trouble right now. Here's why he is giving them that word. Verse 23, rejoice in that day, whenever that day is that men hate you because of me. Rejoice in that day because great is your reward in heaven for that is how, the, that is how their fathers treated the prophets. He says those who weep now are the ones he is referring to that are suffering now. He's telling them that men hate you because of me. We're going through this series and we're going through this time when you see the Pharisees really had a disgust for Jesus. And I can't imagine anything else that if you hated the leader, you would hate those who are following him as well. And so they were, he was saying, I know that times are tough. And I know time is now a time in which you are mourning and a time in which you're weeping. But I'm telling you that there's a time coming for the rejoicing. And for those who are rejoicing now, there's a time coming when they're going to weep. When Jesus blessed those, he also reminded them that those who were hated, blessed are you when men hate you. And when they exclude you and insult you and reject your name as evil. And then it tells you why. Because of the Son of Man. He's telling his disciples, and I tell you what, I believe he would tell you today. But we live in a country that, as it said, it is free. Jim says that we're free. We might not be thought of the way we used to be thought of, but we're still free to be able to worship. But I can see the tide turning. I can see a time when in the future then it could be that men would be looked at as 
Christians and the root problem of all that is going on. And that we would be hated because of our love for the world through Jesus. I can see it coming. I can see a time when, when people will be, will, will be ostracized and people will be hated just because of the name of Jesus and their association with him. And he compares that to the prophets of old. That is the way they treated the prophets. That's the way your fathers treated the prophets long ago. But he also says, woe to them, woe to you, when men speak well of you. But that is how their fathers treated the false prophets. The false prophets that came in, that spoke the things of name it and claim it, wealth, prosperity, everybody ought to be happy and everybody ought to be wealthy and everybody ought to be without sickness. You hear it all the time today. Just turn on the television. They have auditoriums and stadiums full of people who want to hear that. And when they hear it, they're listening to it, I believe, from a false prophet. Because that is not the gospel of Jesus Christ. The gospel must have in it that there is a sinfulness that separates us from God. There is a time of judgment that is coming for that sin. And Jesus came to pay for that judgment. And for everyone who receives him as a witness to his resurrection from the dead, they will be saved. You don't hear that a lot in churches today. You hear a lot about being the best you can be. About how God wants to bless you. God wants to put blessings on your head all the time, every day. And all you have to do is do this and do that. Never once saying, though, that you must first and foremost be dependent upon him. See, Jesus paints with black and white strokes. There is no gray. It is to draw a line so that we must choose. Which side are you on? I believe immediately everybody would want to say, I am not that poor, but I'm not that rich either. I'm not starving, but I'm not a glutton. I'm not weeping, but I'm not a comedian. And people, they don't throw eggs at me, but I'm not Mr. Mr. Popular either. Isn't there room for me in the middle? And Jesus says, no. You decide. For me, or you decide against me. There is no middle ground. Are you living this life for the temporary pleasures of this life? Or are you living for Jesus and his kingdom? You see, we must have an eternal point of view. We must understand that as believers, we're on a pilgrimage. This is not our home. We're going to our home. And that only for a short period of time. 60, 70 years, the scripture says, if we have the strength. And if we have that mindset that we are pilgrims on this earth and that we're only passing through this earth, we will have the right idea of what it means to live in dependency upon the Lord. Charles Simon says, he alone is happy who is happy for eternity. We're never really happy unless we're going to be happy in eternity. D.L. Moody says this life is all the heaven that some people of this world it will ever see. And it is all the hell that the saints of glory will ever see. Right now, saints of glory are seeing some hell here upon the earth. We'll never see that in heaven. He'll remove it from us. So the question I have for you today is, do you want God's blessings in your life? 
Do you want God's blessings in your life? I ask that sometimes, especially in marriage counseling. I talked to a couple this week and I shared that with them, that people will come and want to be married at the church. They will want a pastor to do the wedding for their marriage. They may never come to church at all. They may never desire to be in God's house on any other day of the week or any other time of their life. But at their wedding, they want it in a church and they want a pastor to do it. Why is that? It's because they want to be blessed, right? And so they think that if I'm in a church and I have a pastor do it, somehow that's like a lucky rabbit's foot, which was never lucky for the rabbit, was it? <clears throat> and they think that that could somehow bring blessing upon them if they're in the right place and they have the right person do it. There is no truth to that whatsoever. The truth is, if you want the blessings of God, you do what God tells us to do. And that is to be poor towards the things of this world and to be, to be rich towards him, to put our total allegiance into him and to be hungry after what he has to offer, not what the world would force us to eat. And that we would instead be people who are sad sometimes over the estate of the affairs of this country, over the estate of people's lostness in our own homes, in our own neighborhoods, in our own workplaces. That we grieve sometimes over the lostness of people. We grieve sometimes over our own sinfulness. And he says when you do, there's great reward coming one day for you. And he says also that we are to be people who look and walk as Christians even though people may hate us. I praise the Lord that I don't have anybody that I know that hates me. We're not in a country that's like that some, so far. Maybe that's because we're not living up to the level that Christ wants us to live up to. Maybe if I lived up here, more people would hate me, and that would be better for me. God wants us to be people that live different than the world. The only problem is sometimes we're just exactly like the world. And the only difference is Sunday morning between 10.30 and 11.30. We come to church, but we live much like the world the rest of the week. The person living for God's blessings has deliberately decided to reject the world's values and to live under the lordship of Jesus as king. Turning their back on the fleeting world and its pleasures, he is living in light of eternity. So I ask, do you want the blessings of God? Do you want to live happily ever after? We must do as God has instructed us. Not like everybody else is. We're called to be different. We're called to live different. We're called to live for the glory of God and not 